everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Woo! I feel so relaxed. <laughs> My family just returned from a month-long trip in Brazil. It was really, really good. We got to experience nature, wildlife, amazing food, and of course, we got to see family. There are definitely some ups and downs when traveling with a baby and a toddler. At one point, I was on the verge of tears on the airplane because I realized it's impossible to sleep vertically while having a squirming human in my lap. Uh, at times, we were horrified by Clara's piercing screams echoing through the airplane cabin. Uh, yeah, we were that family that annoys every single other human on board. It wasn't fun. <laughs> but today, I'm not going to speak about the struggles of traveling with children I'm going to be talking about the highlights of our trip and most importantly, teach 10 very common collective nouns for animals. Now, a collective noun is a word used to describe a group. For example, when you see a lot of birds flying together, we would call them a flock, right? A flock of birds flew overhead. Randomly, flock is also used for sheep, so the shepherd led a flock of sheep back home. It's important to note that there are a ton of collective nouns for animals in English. However, there is a small number that are regularly used in conversations. In this lesson, the goal is to only teach you what the average American knows and uses. I don't want to teach things that are not useful. So pay attention, stay tuned. At the very end, you will hear the full list and also get an opportunity to practice your pronunciation. So let's go ahead and begin with a story. Years ago, before Lucas and I were born, Lucas's dad was a truck driver. And one day, his friends came across a little bird that was struggling to survive. It was hungry and weak, and Lucas's dad, Idair, decided to take it home. And he wasn't sure what type of bird it was, but by the looks of it, he thought it might be a parrot or a macaw. Day after day, he gave it food and water, and little by little, the bird started to transform. As the bird's body grew, so did its beak. But the beak just kept growing and growing. And it turns out the little bird he'd taken home as a pet was a toucan. Lucas's dad had saved its life. Now, I find this story pretty cute. Maybe it's just the nice juxtaposition of a truck driver saving a baby bird. Maybe it's just Lucas's dad doing it. Or... Also, just the fact that you can find a toucan outdoors in its natural habitat. That's crazy for me. For me, toucans exist in zoos, parrots, parakeets, and all of the colorful birds are found in pet shops, <laughs> inside of cages. What I love about Brazil is that you can find these in nature. Even if you plan a trip that has nothing to do with nature when you're in Brazil, nature will find you. Lucas's sister lives in a city called Cochin, which once was the biggest fishing capital of Brazil, or so they say. Locally, it's known as the paradise of waters because that's where many rivers come together. About 20 years ago, you could take a little motorboat out on the river to go fishing and catch a wide variety of fish. There was an abundance of fish. Schools of them would swim right under the water's surface. 
A lot of the fish's names I'm not familiar with other than catfish. We had some delicious catfish while we were there. But I don't think a lot of the fish actually exist in English-speaking countries, especially in the United States. And it made me wonder if the reason why there's no translation is because they're not exported, right? Maybe some of these regional delicacies they have in that area of Brazil, which is called Mato Grosso do Sul, are only in that region. I'm not sure. Anyway, we decided to take a trip on a little boat to check out the environment. My goal was, of course, to see a toucan. <laughs> Word on the street was that they are pretty common in Lucas's sister's region. Toucans and colorful red and blue macaws, I was told, travel in pairs in the sky. They land in treetops. You could spot them actually from a distance. You can hear them. They're very loud. We were also told that it was possible to spot jaguars and giant anteaters. Some of these animals have strange names. Once again, that's a toucan, a blue macaw, M-A-C-A-W, jaguar, J-A-G-U-A-R, and anteater, A-N-T-E-A-T-E-R. So there we were in our little boat, our brother-in-law's friend from church behind the wheel, and it was a clear day. So we made our way up the river. And as we sped by, we could see a lot of local fishermen sitting on the riverbanks, others on docks with their fishing poles, probably trying to catch lunch. Both sides of the river, just to give you an idea, were lined with trees and bushes. And I'm not sure if I would consider this forest or not. I'm not sure if I would even call it a jungle, but in any case, there was a lot of trees and bushes, and all of us stared into them, hoping to see something cool. The first thing we saw was a blue and yellow macaw up in a palm tree. We did not see a flock of macaws, like you might have seen if you saw the movie Rio 2. We just saw one up at the very top, just hanging out. Then came a monkey, and then another monkey. There wasn't a family of monkeys, just a few of them spread out. At one point, an alligator emerged above the surface of the water. It wasn't a congregation of alligators, just one, and he quickly disappeared from sight. Then, of course, we saw some storks. I'm sure you're familiar with what a stork is. It's common to hear people say that storks carry babies. It's a, an old-fashioned tale in the U.S. And anyway, uh, the stork is sort of a symbol or a mascot of the region. So, yeah, as I mentioned, Cochin is where many rivers come together. And one of the main rivers or areas is called the Pantanal. It's the largest tropical wetland in the world, and it's in Brazil. Most of it is actually in the region where uh, Lucas's family is from, in Mato Grosso do Sul and in just Mato Grosso. At the mouth of the river, right, the mouth of the river is where a river kind of spills into a larger body. The water was very shallow. It wasn't very deep. And so we needed to get out and walk the boat through in order to make it to the other side. And we ended up swimming in the water right then and there. It was just one of those moments where I thought, this is definitely a highlight of the trip. Swimming in the middle of a river in Brazil, having seen so many interesting animals up in the treetops, also in the water. Uh, if the water hadn't been clear, there's no way that we would have swum in it for fear of piranhas, alligators, and fish even. But we could see the bottom, so no fear there. And Julia had the time of her life swimming with her cousins. On a second adventure, we went to a place called Seven Falls. At the entrance of the waterfalls, there was an inn with little houses for rent, 
Outside, there were a few cabanas with hammocks underneath. And all of this was mixed in a bunch of tropical trees and vegetation. At least in this area of Brazil, you can almost guarantee there are going to be palm trees. uh, The kind of palm trees with coconuts and without. Banana trees, papaya trees, lots of mango trees as well. I could honestly keep chatting away about what it looked like in this little paradise. But the point is, it was very scenic. We didn't know what to expect before arriving, but the place more than exceeded our expectations. Honestly, if this place existed in the U.S., it would be packed with people. There would be crowds of people. But actually, there were practically no people at all. So we swam for hours, made sandcastles on a mini beach that was there. We fed some stale bread to a school of fish in the deep end of the swimming hole. Before this trip, I had never sat under a waterfall. We all got hydro massages. We had a picnic as well, which was a bit of a challenge given that there was a colony of ants nearby. But we managed to enjoy our sandwiches and fruit before they discovered us. The cherry on top of our trip at the falls was back in the parking lot when we almost ran over a three foot long lizard. The funny thing about it, there was a man sitting close by. And when we opened our window to comment on the fact that we almost ran over a three foot long lizard, he yelled out to us that this monster-like lizard was named Johnny. Johnny the giant Brazilian lizard. Not something you see every day in California, maybe in Florida, maybe in the South, I'm not sure. I will 100% share images of this on Instagram. So be sure to check out this week's post at American English Podcast. Before we move on to a few other highlights, I want to point out some of the common collective nouns I've used so far. These are terms that all Americans would know. First off, we have a flock of birds. Sometimes birds travel in pairs, but when you see a lot of birds together, many, many birds, we would call it a flock. Schools of fish, right? We fed stale bread to a school of fish. A family of monkeys. You know, I wasn't sure what I'd call a group of monkeys. Uh, I talked to my mom about it, and we both agreed that the words I found on Google, which were tribe, troop, and barrel, sound sort of ridiculous. Uh, We might use them in other circumstances with monkeys. For example, a barrel of monkeys is a game in the U.S. Tribe and troop, eh, I won't go into detail, but... We decided that family sounds better. It's a safe alternative, actually, for most animals. When you don't know what the collective noun is, you can rely on family being a safe bet. We also had a colony of ants. You might also hear an army of ants and a crowd of people. So fortunately, there were no crowds at the waterfalls. When traveling through Brazil, at least central Brazil, it's not uncommon to see herds of cattle. Cattle are sort of domesticated cows and buffalo and things like that. Animals raised for dairy and beef. You might also see flocks of sheep. What was probably most interesting, though, was the hundreds of ostriches we passed on the highway. We were actually on the lookout for them. Our brother-in-law had told us before our trip that we would pass thousands. And honestly, it felt like there were a jillion. Why? I don't know. Beats me. I don't know. Do people eat ostriches? I know their eggs are really big, so you can probably make a huge omelet. But anyway, for the first time in my life, I told Lucas, hey, look, it's a flock of ostriches. Sounds kind of funny to say, but flock of ostriches is correct. Anyway, as a last mini story for this episode, 
I'd like to share a little bit about the last week we spent on a ranch in a place called Braganza Paulista. This was most definitely a highlight of our trip because it's the first time I met up with one of the listeners of this podcast, Priscilla Marchins, who is an English teacher from Rio, started listening to this podcast when it came out in 2019. Back then, she reached out to me. We shared a few messages here and there. And yeah, when I asked if she'd be interested in spending a week at one of Lucas's clients' homes, she quickly agreed. So she traveled from Rio to meet us. Together, we headed to that client's home. Once again, Lucas is a music producer, so it's one of the singers he works for. And the house was on an acre of land. To explain this real quick, in the U.S., we use acres, A-C-R-E-S, to talk about expanses of land. It's a common measurement. One acre is about the size of an American football field. In other words, the property was big, and it was smack dab in the middle of nature. It was surrounded by hills, and there was a river nearby. Priscilla and I and the girls, we just hung out. We really didn't do much else other than play, go near the pool, eat lots of food, play some more. On one of the days, we walked down to the river and saw a huge group of capybaras, a plethora, an abundance of capybaras. I've talked about these animals before. They sort of look like an oversized hamster or like groundhog. They're massive. Technically, as a group, they're called a meditation, which sounds very odd <laughs> and also accurate just because 26 capybaras were sitting there and they all truly looked like they were meditating. But I would actually use the term huge group just because family sounds a little bit too small and meditation is just not common. So we got fairly close to them, unsure of whether they would attack or not. Fortunately, they didn't. And we managed to get a nice little photo of them staring off into the distance. I really like capybaras. Uh, it was funny. The first time we went to Brazil, uh, we went to a little island and my dad was fed capybara. He had no idea what he was eating and didn't find out until afterwards that he was eating one of those. But I don't think you're actually technically supposed to eat them. I think that's illegal. At the ranch, we woke up one of the mornings to a bunch of monkeys on the trees outside. In the U.S., if you've been here before, you might know it's not common to see monkeys in the wilderness at least not in the places I've been to. I've been to quite a few U.S. states. Bears are pretty common, wolves maybe, but monkeys, oh, that's so exciting. So, so exciting as a foreigner. The ones that we saw are called sagui, I believe, and they're extra tiny, unlike any other monkeys that we have at our zoos. And they have funky little hair poking from the sides of their head. Looks like they have a nice little hairdo itty bitty hands and feet and they really come up very close when you have some food in your hand. So we cut up some bananas and apples and they grabbed the little pieces right from our fingertips. And the looks on Julia's and Clara's faces were priceless. I mean, who doesn't like animals? <laughs> Of course, nature isn't always easy. Every time I go to a place that's tropical or just, yeah, where there's warm water and air, it seems like the mosquitoes come and attack. I feel like a swarm of mosquitoes were sleeping inside of my room with me during this trip. Everybody else was perfectly fine, but by the end of the first week and a half, I was covered in little red bites. There probably actually wasn't a swarm of mosquitoes in the room. It was probably just one really fat mosquito with a big appetite. All in all, it was a successful trip. 
Julia and Clara want to go back to Brazil already. When I tell Julia, Julia, do you like Brazil? She keeps saying more, more, more Brazil. But I have a hard time imagining taking a plane flight with both of them in the near future. Let's see. But yeah, before we get to the list of most common collective nouns, I want to give another big shout out to Priscilla. Thank you so much for spending a week with me and the girls. It was really great and I have wonderful memories with you. For any other listeners out there, if we ever happen to be going on a trip where you live, please don't hesitate to write to us. Uh, Once COVID slows, we'd love to meet up with more of you in person. It's really exciting, truly. All right, to wrap this up, we'll go through the complete list of most common collective nouns. I tried to include the majority of these in the story, but some didn't really fit. So let's see if we can make them fit now. A school of fish. Repeat after me. If you swim in the river, you'll probably see a school of fish. A flock of birds, or sheep, or goats. Repeat after me. If you saw a flock of birds above your head, would you run? A crowd of people. Repeat after me. If you went to a restaurant or bar and there were crowds of people, would you go inside? A colony of ants or army of ants. Repeat after me. We ate lunch near an ant colony. A herd of elephants, cattle, or cows, buffalo, horses, deer, moose. A herd is, well, this is a very common term, and we use it colloquially to talk about land mammals. It gives you the impression that an animal moves across land or grazes the land. Repeat after me. If you go on a safari, you might see a herd of elephants. A pack of wolves, dogs, bears, maybe? Repeat after me. If you go to Alaska, you might see a pack of wolves. A swarm of bees, mosquitoes, wasps, flies. These are sort of insects or things that fly. You can kind of imagine them being small and, you know, in a group, in a bunch. Repeat after me, if you walked by a beehive and a swarm of bees followed you, what would you do? A litter of kittens, puppies, piglets, and baby animals. Any sort of baby animal, pretty much, I believe, can be called a litter if there's a bunch of them. So repeat after me. How many kittens are in the litter? A pride of lions. For a while, Simba left his pride. A family of beavers, ducks, rabbits. Once again, you can use a family if you don't know which collective noun to use. There was a family of dolphins swimming in the ocean. In addition to saying a family, you can also say there is a ton of, a bunch of, or a lot of to emphasize the quantity of one specific animal or object. So there are a bunch of, or a ton of, or yeah, a lot of rabbits over there. Uh, I also used a jillion In this episode, a jillion is like, it's just a lot, something that you cannot fathom. You don't know how many, but there are a ton. Oh man, there were like a jillion ostriches on the side of the road. Jillion is very casual. Or if you want to use fancier English, you can say an abundance of, 
a concentration of, or a significant number of. There was an abundance of capybaras near the riverbank. There was a concentration of capybaras near the riverbank. There was a significant number of capybaras near the riverbank. That's it for this episode. If you want to check out the images from our vacation to get some visuals to go alongside this audio, be sure to visit the Instagram page for this podcast at American English Podcast. If you want to get the full transcript for this episode, as well as the MP3 download and quiz to test your listening comprehension, be sure to sign up to season three at AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. I hope you're having a lovely day and until next time, bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.